So this is just a very quick video to say why I've not been posting much recently. Same old story, same old story. Um, because I've been really busy doing other stuff, which, as you notice, the bonnet's ajar. And that's primarily because I've had to take my intake manifold off again. So, the reason for that, not the car again, I will now show you on the manifold itself. Which luckily isn't too bad to get off in all fairness, um, but what really annoys me is it's nothing to do with anything I've done. So the problem's been for a little while now since I had it rebuilt and running that I've had a lean code on the left bank of the engine. So as we're looking at it now, that bank there, um, we're obviously looking as if this was the front of the car and we're looking towards the windscreen there. And I did a lot of digging into it. I smoke tested the engine again, couldn't find anything, which is interesting, I'll come back to that. Um, I found a couple of damaged wires on the oxygen sensor, the one that had, had damaged wires before, and also, if I can just find it here, what I did find was the solder seal connectors had just basically separated. I mean, that's one that I was just able to pull off the wire, um, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, there's the other half of one of them, and you can see again there, there's perfectly visible copper wire there with no solder engagement. So I think for low temperature applications, the old solder seal works fine, but for something high temp in an engine bay, my advice now would be consider just soldering them or even just splicing them normally, and crimping them. But anyway, fixed those wires and started getting accurate readings on the oxygen sensors and the fuel trims, and the fuel trim on this bank was about 7 or 8 percent, which is bang on, you want it under 10. On this bank it was 25 to 35, depending how you're revving it. And I've got another video I'll produce on fuel trims and oxygen sensor readings and all that kind of stuff, because I've learned a lot recently. But just to say, 25 to 35 is not good. But as I said, I'd smoke tested it, couldn't find an obvious leak. And normally, a lean running is either going to be fuel, uh, too little, air, too much, or sensors not reading correctly. So I replaced the auction sensors, they were aftermarket anyway, the original ones. So replaced them with the original Lexus and got proper readings, uh, repaired the wires, all that kind of stuff, and it was still telling me very lean, and you could see that on the auction sensors. I then smoke tested it, and there was nothing showing through, I couldn't see any leaks like I had in the previous video. And I knew because it was doing the same on both petrol and LPG, which used completely different fuel systems, that it wasn't going to be fuel. So I was really scratching my head and then I decided to physically check things. Now I've mucked around with the VVT units and the camshaft so I thought maybe the engine's out of time, maybe there's other damage, maybe the valves that had been repaired were leaking, all that kind of stuff. So I did a leak down test, I did a compression test and the compression test was over 150 psi on every cylinder so absolutely no issues there. I just did that bank obviously because this one we know was fine. Um, the leak down test, I'll show the results now. So I've got the leak down tester in, had it set with the uh, regulator into the yellow zone, connected it to cylinder one, which is at top dead centre. And as you can see, we're looking at just under 10% leakage, which is absolutely fine. So now I just need to go down and do the other three and see what they tell me. And now we're set on cylinder number three, good contact with the probe, and again under 10% loss, no issues whatsoever. Now set on cylinder five, once again under 10% loss, no issues with that. And then finally cylinder number seven. is pretty healthy. <laughs> you can hear the air escaping a bit, but that's normal. There's going to be some leakage. The key point is that gauge is not showing anything outside the norm. And as you can see, there was less than 10% leakage on all cylinders, which is really, really healthy. So no issues there. I checked the timing marks on the camshaft and they were all bang on. The timing marks on the 
the pulleys were all bang on, so it wasn't out of time, it wasn't leaking, there wasn't a damaged valve, there was nothing mechanically wrong with the engine. However, when I started putting it back together and started putting the LPG hoses on, for avoidance of doubt, that is one of the, the, the nozzles for the LPG injector hoses to go onto from the injectors themselves, which sit separate and rear. So injector, small hose, goes onto that bayonet fitting and allows the LPG to be injected directly into the port for each cylinder. These ones are nice and firm. This one, although it's, it's worse now, but when I started just giving them all a little nip and tuck, it was just free turning. So the threads that have been tapped into the intake manifold through that hole there were basically gacked, um, not working at all. I managed to prove that this was definitely the problem by using thread lock just to really gum that in. And suddenly the fuel trims on this side went down to 4.7%. So I knew that was the culprit. However, thread lock's not really designed for high temperature vibration kind of environment, which is what this now was. So that failed pretty quickly, but at least it allowed me to finally diagnose what the hell was going on. So I then tried a proper thread sealant um, that's meant to be high temperature and vibration resistant. That didn't work, and I think that was mainly because, as you can see, there, there is no real thread to seal. Um, that is just, you, you can turn this a little bit, but it just comes straight out. So that obviously didn't work, and I knew I had to get the intake off. Um, because that is going to have to be drilled out and helicoiled with something that will allow me to fit that in and seal it. I've already used the thread sealant on these three here, because I had access to them. And to be honest, I'm probably going to leave them as are, because I think they're pretty tight. There's no issues there. This side, I'm probably going to take these out as well. And again, use the thread seal. Ah, there we go. Live on camera. That one is turning as well. I think it's turning in the threads. But that explains, I was going to say, literally at this point, I was going to say... Because it was 4.7 fuel trim on this side and about 8, 9 on that side, I was already a little bit suspicious that one of these was slightly leaky because you want to see fuel trims normally around the 4 or 5%. So I was already going to investigate these and funny little thing, literally, as we found it, that one there, I can turn by hand. So the question I've got now <clears throat> is do I helicoil all of these and hang the expense? Or do I just thread seal the ones that appear sound and possibly helicoil that one and definitely helicoil that one? So I'm off to a machinist shop in Exeter just down the road from me with this thing in tow to have that chat with someone that knows what we're doing. I don't want to tackle it myself because if I get the drilling wrong or the tapping for the helicoil wrong or anything like that wrong, I'm looking at a new lower intake manifold, which I suspect is not going to be cheap. Um, and that'll be a bit annoying. So I'll get them done properly by someone that's done them before and therefore have no more issues. Right, it's a few days later. I've just gone and picked up the intake from a machine shop. And what I've actually had done on a bit of reflection was have all of the fittings tapped and redone because I don't want to have to do this again and in the end that turned out to be the right decision and what the shop's actually done which you can probably see now is rather than using helicoils which are basically you drill out the the hole and then put effectively like a coil of wire through that then acts to bite the threads what they've actually used instead is time certs which is basically a cylinder with male and female threads um, male on the outside female on the inside. Uh, so you drill out the hole, I'll put a picture off if I can find one, but you drill out the hole, screw the insert in, and then you've got an actual thread for the fitting to engage with, which is obviously a lot more secure than a coil. So that's been done to all eight at a very good price, um, so no complaints there whatsoever. Unfortunately, what did happen, though, is that one of these little uh, nozzles sheared away at the thread side when it was being removed, which is silly, you know, stuff happens. So I've got another one of those on the way, um, but until that arrives, 
I can't actually get all this back together. What I can do in the meantime though is get the rest of these mounted and use a decent thread sealer. In this case it's uh, Permatex 59214 so it's a high temperature uh, thread sealant that resists vibration etc. It's what I used when I tried to put these back in before but obviously there's no thread. So this time should be a bit more successful and that'll just make absolutely sure there is no vacuum leaks um, past these threads. Um, I could use PTFE tape uh, that would be equally effective, but I've got the thread sealant, so it'll be silly not to use it. What I've also got is a new set of intake gaskets um, for the, each of the runners. I didn't trust, even though it's new ones on there, I don't particularly think uh, the third or fourth time that's now been on will be good for them. And I've also got a new set of fuel um, pressure regulator crush washers as well, because again, if I just reuse the old ones, which have already been on and off a couple of times now, you can see that's been crushed. That would just guarantee me a fuel leak later on. So, for the want of one nozzle, we'll be good to go. But until then, it's time to get all of these buttoned up with nozzles and sealer. So I'll get onto that now. And a very few minutes later, that's this side completely done. And then all that's left on this side is just that one nozzle there, which has got to go in when that one arrives. But yeah, you can see the sealant around the edges, and unfortunately what I couldn't find was an approved torque um, spec for these. So I've just had to use a little bit of judgement, knowing that they can snap, and done the German method of good and tight, without being ridiculous about it. At the end of the day, the thread sealer will do its job, so long as they're engaged with the threads and snugged up. It's only going to be the vacuum of an intake manifold that this thing's resisting, so that should be more than decent to hold that intake. So yeah, one nozzle and this is going back on. Well the fitting arrived, it's been installed and what I've spent the time since then doing is getting all the gubbins attached to the underside of the intake which is primarily the vacuum canister there, the VSV and then a couple of vacuum lines, one from the canister and then the actual feed to the actuator for the inner bodies in there to lengthen the uh, the runners, which is all working fine. Always remember to put the fuel line on the back. Ask me why I'm emphasizing that one, because I forgot to do it the first time I had this intake off. And then you can just kind of tweak that when it goes on. A line to take the vacuum feed from the manifold itself. And then a few other clips and pins to hold everything in place. And then you've also got the feed for the VSV, which plugs onto the top of the intake there. You can leave that loose. I've put it on there just to make sure it doesn't get trapped when I'm putting the manifold back on. The uh, mating surface has been given a good clean. The gaskets are in place, ready to go. So it's now a case of getting this stuck back on. And that's it installed but not bolted or anything like that, but just getting that in is a right pain. And the things you've got to watch out for is the vacuum canister which cuts, catches right on the coolant line here, and also locating it on these four uh, corner studs is not made easy by these coolant pipes which want to come down and trap the rear end. I mean, you can't lift it up enough to get it over and then down onto the studs. So a degree of fiddling is necessary, and a fair bit of swearing, but maybe that's just me. But now I can get all these bolts on, tighten them to 18 newton meters, there's no tightening pattern. Throttle body on, and then we'll get the fuel rails on. So that's the fuel rail in. Bolts are along the nuts are snugged up. And another point worth mentioning is that the fuel feed line goes under the wiring loom, you need to do a bit of finagling to get that in. The next thing is to get the fuel pressure regulator mounted through the banjo fitting there and into the fuel rail. And to do that there's two washers which requires a degree of fiddling. The first one is fairly simple because it goes upper. This one however which goes between the banjo and the rail just get the right angle. Where are we? Oh yeah, there we are. Between the banjo and the mounting on the rail there is an absolute pain. And again, I'm going to need both hands to get that done. Another point of note is, you're going to have to remove, if you're using as I am, an adjustable to turn the fuel pressure regulator. 
you will most likely need to remove one of the manifold bolts, uh, the upper manifold bolts, to give you access to actually turn the thing uh, and start tightening it. Same thing with loosening. But that's simple, you just replace that bolt when you're done, 18 newton meters, and you're good to go. So, I'll get that done now. And that's it in. And as you can see, there's no way of getting a torque wrench in there. So all I've done is just tighten up as tight as I can, bearing in mind it's crushed washers. And as soon as I've seen the washers start to deform, that's pretty much it. Um, and that's that fuel rail now installed. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And then all I've got to start doing is plugging in all the injector connectors, the LPG injectors, which are all here. And these are the hoses that go onto those bayonet fittings. Uh, so they just clip on free, get all that in place, and get this thing started up again. And that's everything installed and back together, tested and working. Although the slight postscript to this is, as I was saying earlier, it's, a lot, it's quite difficult to get those coolant lines, the intake in under them. Well, because I had to take the intake out yet again, because when I put it together the first time there was still an intake leak, um, very obviously, so I had to take it all out again and basically use RTV on the, the intake runners in the heads and then on top of the gaskets before the intake went on and that's now fixed it, uh, which is a bit weird, and the intake must be a bit if. But what I have found is I can now take this intake out in around 30 minutes. And the reason being is if you just take these lines off and lose about an egg cup full of uh, coolant, you can then unbolt these from the top and cable time up out the way pull all the other stuff back, cable tie, and you don't actually need to take the fuel lines out to get the intake out, which is what the workshop manual would have you believe. You just need to undo the fuel line here, finagle it out underneath the loom there, and basically you can take it out with the fuel lines intact, which saves a lot, I mean a lot of time and effort. So like I said, 30 minutes to get it off, a little bit of RTVing of the intake runners and gaskets, which shouldn't have to be done, but in this case it has worked and I was careful about it, so so be it. Um, and back in took me about 40 minutes, and that was mainly just because of all the fiddliness of getting the, the LPG hoses back on, which is always a faff. But yeah, um, what's regarded as a fairly complex job has now turned into about an hour and a half turnaround time um, because of just doing it again and again and again. But anyway, that's now done, and to prove it, let's have a look at the fuel trims. Well, as you can see, the car's nice and warm. Just been out for a long drive, just to check it over again. No faults in the dash bar TPMS, which is something I'm going to get to later. And if I call up the fuel trims, which should hopefully come good in a second. There we go. So as you can see, the long-term fuel trim on both bank one and two is comfortably under 10. Uh, bank one, the one I've been working on, is particularly good. Uh, bank 2, not as good, but still decent. Um, bearing in mind I've not had that one dismantled and redone and so on, so it's probably a little bit um, less decent, but anyway. But the good thing is those short-term fuel, fuel trims are bang on what you'd be looking at for idle. And as I said, there's no uh, double-digit readings for the long term, so that issue has finally been solved. So now... I can finally get back after starting this engine work in August of last year. It's now April of the following year, and I would say I'm finally ready to get started on all the other things I mentioned in the uh, in my review video. So, taking a lot longer than I thought, but finally I can start moving forward. Took a while. <laughs> 